I lied on the application. I just thought I was doing what was in the best interest of my daughters. I was kind of like the big man on campus. It kind of got a little easier with each one that I did after that to the point where it started to feel a little bit comfortable and there was nothing wrong with doing it. I knew it was wrong. I didn't know how illegal it was. I figured it was illegal. I just didn't think I was going to get caught. When you have the, the mindset, or when you think that everybody else is doing it, it makes it a lot easier to consider what you've done is legitimate. I, I'm pretty sure I convinced myself that I wasn't harming anything or anyone. A white lie now became a huge black lie. And, oh, she's such a liar. I wasn't a slut. You know, I wasn't the partier. I wasn't the bad girl. I wasn't the drug druggie. I was a liar. At a certain point, the monster's so big that it doesn't need you anymore and you can't control it, and you can kind of just hope that it doesn't eat you. I even asked my lawyer, I mean, I'm certainly not going to go to jail for this. I mean, you know, what, you know, what, what, what do they do with guys like me? They don't send me to jail. Can I pick up paper on the road? I mean, what am I going to do? And he says, no, they send guys like you to jail. While I wished I didn't have to go through that, I understand now, oh, OK, I'm not the only one, you know? This is a deeply human experience. My name is Dan Ariely, and I'm interested in human behavior. I'm interested in rationality and irrationality. I'm interested in the cases in which we make good decisions and the cases in which we make bad decisions. Together with colleagues and students, we run hundreds of experiments to try and understand human behavior. And in the last few years, we've been focusing on dishonesty. I find myself, especially here at school, um, lying a lot about, I guess not really lying, but um, I guess, I don't know. Oh, sometimes I like put on fake accents. I've convinced several people that I'm from Russia. Well, I guess I've lied to my parents before. Like, I had a girlfriend and you know, in high school. It's, it's hard to find time with your girlfriend. So I've done that whole thing, you know. I think we all have a few times. My research falls within a field called behavioral economics. And behavioral economics challenges many of the assumptions of standard economics. In standard economics, we assume that people are perfect decision makers, that we can compare all the options, that we don't have any limitations of cognitive capacity. Behavioral economics doesn't make any assumptions. Instead, what we do is we put people in different situations and we just see how they behave. And what we see happening in those experiments is that often people don't think long term. People are myopic and vindictive. We find that people are not able to consider all the options, and we also find that they don't always behave in a perfectly rational way. I first became interested in irrationality as a result of a tragic accident. When I was a teenager, I participated in the youth movement in Israel. And we were preparing for a celebration, and we had these magnesium flares that were supposed to light up the arena. But instead, one of them exploded next to me. And as a consequence, I was burned on over 70% of my body, and I spent the next three years in hospital. The worst part of my day was the process of removing my bandages. The nurses believed that the right approach would be to rip the bandages off one after the other as quickly as possible to get it over with. And I, as somebody who suffered this excruciating pain, 
wanted them to do things slower, take more time, give me a break from time to time. But of course, they ended up doing what they thought is the right thing to do. And the longer I stayed in hospital, the more frustrated I became. And the more examples of irrationalities I would see all around me. The study of irrationality became my profession, my hobby, and the focus of my life. When I left the hospital, I started studying at the university. I didn't have much money for research, so I went to a hardware store and I bought a carpenter's vice. And I set it up in a lab and I asked people to come and put two fingers <laughs> in this vice. And I would crunch people's fingers just a little bit for different durations and intensity and patterns over time, and I would check their preferences. How painful was this and which pattern would you prefer and so on. I learned that the nurses were wrong in systematic and predictable ways. They were focusing on shortening the duration, where in fact they should have tried to minimize the intensity. And from that point on, I started looking at all kinds of ways to think about irrational behavior. How we think about money and health and savings and how we procrastinate and all kinds of things. And among one of those was the question of dishonesty. When we started looking at dishonesty, my colleagues and I thought this was just another example of human irrationality. Another example of the mistakes that we all make and that we don't understand very well. But the world around us seemed to be telling us that this is actually a more important topic to study. We watch corporate scandals everywhere. Enron, WorldCom, the financial crisis of 2008. We saw an increase in cheating in professional sports. Have you ever used steroids? No. I have never used steroids. I have never doped. We witnessed political deception and its huge repercussions. Well, we don't torture people. L let me say that again to you. We don't torture people. It appears that there were not weapons of mass destruction there. You said you knew where they were. I did not. I said I knew where suspect sites were. Does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. It does not. Not wittingly. All of a sudden, the world was telling us that it's more important to understand dishonesty. And not just to understand what's causing it, but also to understand what we can do to try and curb it and reduce it. How many people here have lied at least once since the beginning of 2014? How many people here think of yourself in general as honest, wonderful people? <laughs> the same group. How can it be? How can it be that at the same time we think of ourselves as, as honest and then we recognize that we're dishonest? It turns out it's all about rationalization. On one hand, we want to look at the mirror and think that we're good, honest, wonderful people. On the other hand, we want to benefit selfishly from being dishonest. As long as we cheat just a little bit, we don't have to pay any price in terms of the image and the way we view ourselves. And we call this the fudge factor. So this is the ability to misbehave and think of ourselves as good people. And you can think about all kinds of ways in which in your own life you have a fudge factor. The speed limit. Maybe it says 55, but are you okay in driving 60? What about cheating a little bit on taxes? What about exaggerating their online dating profile? <laughs> Across many studies, we find that everything that changes the fudge factor also changes people's ability to be dishonest. There are dozens of elements that can change the magnitude of the fudge factor. And we've been able to observe many of them in the lab. For example, if you can say to yourself, everybody is doing it, it's easier for you to rationalize to yourself that this is actually an okay thing to do and cheat to a higher degree. My name is Joe Papp. I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and I was a professional cyclist. I was utterly crazy for cycling, loved it. Okay, now get the, watch the tire compression. I started bike racing my first year of high school. Let's go! Come on, Joe! I competed for the University of Pittsburgh's team when I was an undergraduate there, and then 
I took two and a half years off to compete for the U.S. national team all over the world. And for the sprint for the bronze, booted in second, and it's Joe Pat. I had a really successful season, and I went to the Olympic trials, actually. But then the academic year was starting in the fall, and there was a deadline to register for classes, and I felt the need to return to my studies. So I stayed in school uh, through 2000 when I graduated with my undergraduate degree, but couldn't get rid of the, the bike bug, and I went back to cycling. And so I start cycling again full time at that point, and I'm not Lance Armstrong, but I had been successful at the professional level for five or six years before that. And when I got back into the races, things were different. Basically, the races were faster. There was one race in particular that I remember in Massachusetts. It was an event that, you know, I would have typically thought that I had a chance of winning, and instead, it took everything I had just to be able to, to stay in the field. And that had never happened before. I remember crying feeling like I was a failure and how could this be? And you know, it took a, a couple, it took a couple days to kind of process what had happened really. And I remember talking to one of my teammates on the phone and I remember him like chuckling as if he was uh, in on a joke that I didn't know about. And that was the point when I learned about doping. My teammate said, you should go see Dr. So-and-so. She'll take care of you. And I met with this doctor, and I said, I'm a, you know, I'm a cyclist, and I can't uh, match the performance of these other athletes. And so she looked at my blood work, and uh, she said, well, yeah, we can prescribe you EPO, which is a drug that is given to cancer patients who are going through chemotherapy. And it basically forces their kidneys to produce more red blood cells but for an elite endurance athlete, once it manifests itself, it's phenomenal. It's like night and day, the, the change. I can tell you exactly how much this drug improved my performance, and it was upwards of 12 to 13%, which is a gargantuan improvement in a sport that is decided in terms of seconds. Not only did I kind of move up a level in the sporting context, but the doping practices increased in their sophistication and uh, pervasiveness as well. 2006 is when I moved to a, an Italian team, and I remember many times the team manager's brother coming to the hotel with a small stainless steel thermos and start parceling out to each rider their own uh, ampule or their own pre-filled syringe or their own pills and then the riders discussing between themselves what they were going to use when for how everyone was complicit in it you all have a shared interest in keeping it quiet and actually supporting one another in it Professional cyclist Joseph Papp said he felt he couldn't win without using performance-enhancing drugs because so many others were doping. I never would have imagined myself doping. But when you have that, the mindset, or when you think that everybody else is doing it, or 70% of the other people are doing it, even if you don't know that to be true, it's, it makes it a lot easier to consider what you've done is legitimate. In order to study this honesty, we need to be able to measure, hopefully precisely, the extent to which people are dishonest. So we have all kinds of methods. I'll describe one of them. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to start, and let's, let's go to the lab. You can just have a seat anywhere with a packet and a pen in front of it. 
We gave people 20 simple math problems. Find the two numbers that add up to 10. These are problems that everybody could solve if they had enough time, but we don't give people enough time. We are going to give you five minutes to solve as many as possible. At the end of the five minutes, please stop. Put your pencil down and count how many questions you got correctly. And now that you know how many questions you got correctly, take the sheet of paper, go to the front of the room, and shred it. People do that, they come to the front, they say they solve six problems, pay them six dollars, they go home. There you go, thank you for participating. What the people in the experiment don't know is that we played with the shredder. The shredder shred the size of the page but the body of the page remains intact. <laughs> and what do we find? On average, people solve four problems and report to be solving six. I solved six. I don't know if this is embarrassing or not, but I got six. I believe I got seven right. We've ran these experiments on 40,000 people. And so far, we found about 20 big cheaters. Those are people who cheated all the way, said they solved 20 problems, and they stole $400 from us. And we also found about 20-some thousand little cheaters, and they stole about $50,000 from us. And I think this is not a bad reflection of reality. Yes, there are some big cheaters out there, but they are very rare. And because of that, their overall economic impact is relatively low. On the other hand, we have a ton of little cheaters. And because there are so many of us, the economic impact of small cheating is actually incredibly, incredibly high. I never told my kids that there was a Santa Claus, or an Easter Bunny, or a Tooth Fairy. I just refused to do that, because when I was very young, I went out to hide in this little chest of drawers at the base of the stairs to catch Santa Claus, and saw that my parents put out Christmas presents, and I was just shocked that they had been systematically deceiving me for years and years and years, and I don't think I ever trusted them again. My mother makes a very special cake for my father's birthday called a Dobostorta, which is a Hungarian vanilla cake with a chocolate cream going up nine layers. And then at the very top is this crunchy caramel. And it is amazing. <laughs> Last year, she gave the cake for me to share with my children. And I hid the cake and ate it by myself. In second grade, I had a little friend named Irving. And Irving was a big liar. One day at lunch, he's telling all of the kids at the table that his father owns a bazooka. <laughs> I was a little kid, you know, a bazooka was like the biggest gun that you could imagine. And people at the table said, no, he doesn't. And he turns to me and says, yeah, he does. David, you've been to my house, you saw the bazooka. And I said, yeah, totally, I've been to your house. Your dad totally owns a bazooka. And then I realized that I had just told a lie and I felt so bad. But then I also thought, wow, you really can't trust people. <laughs> Dan and I were sitting in his office one day and in that particular meeting, we were reflecting on this idea of the evil genius. The fact that oftentimes it seems that uh, creativity and dishonesty come together. At that time, we were reading news about the fact that Bernie Madoff was very creative with his Ponzi scheme. And so we started wondering what creativity does to people. We ended up going into the lab and studying that further. We created situations where people would be asked to be creative or where creativity was primed. And then we asked the people to use the matrix task. And what we found was that when people are in a creative mindset, they're more likely to come up with lots of justifications for why what they're about to do is morally okay and is justifiable. 
PR and marketing almost by their very nature involve the, the, the sort of the step onto the slippery slope. What do you do? You, you have to create something from nothing. And because of that, I kind of just made it up as I went along. I'd been reading this blog, I thought it was really funny. The blogger's name was Tucker Max, and the blog was stories about like drinking and hooking up. It's this gonzo style of storytelling where this guy's going around doing crazy things, getting in all sorts of trouble. They're really funny and, and hilarious, but controversial and, and messed up and evil and awful all at the same time. And uh, I was attracted to something in this writing, and I think it was the honesty and the sort of the authenticity of the way the author was presenting himself. I was just sort of fascinated by it, and I end up emailing the blogger and I say, like, I want to work for you, I'll do whatever you need. There was talk that he would do a book, and he didn't have a publicist or anything. I ended up working on that campaign. It was like, okay, we have this book. I think people would like it. How do we get people to know about it? And because we had nothing, we could try anything. I knew this one blog linked to him a lot, and I was like, how have you got that? And he was like, oh, I just send them fake emails pretending to be either a fan of my stuff or hating my stuff, and I trick them into linking about me. So it's like, okay, if, if that worked with this site, would it work with these bigger sites? Would it work with newspapers? Would it work with television? John, the book is called I Hope They Serve Beer in Hell. And frankly, there is not much in it that can be repeated on a nice family show like yours. Tucker Max, author of I Hope They Serve Beer in Hell. Classy. And so we tried all this new stuff and it ended up working. The book sold close to 2 million copies. After his book became this big bestseller, he ended up producing a movie based on the book. We'd seen how effective controversy had been with driving sales of the book. So it was like, why don't we make this one of those movies that people boycott and say, don't go see, because we knew that our audience would go see it precisely because of that. We ended up trying these tactics of like, well, let's get people to protest. Let's make people horrified so they talk about it more. We would send anonymous emails to LGBT groups on campus, women's groups on campus. We designed these really offensive ads. There was jokes about midgets, strippers, blind people. I went out and I vandalized these ads. Um, I, I put these like offensive stickers all over them. Then I took photos and then I leaked those photos to these two small blogs in Los Angeles. They run this big story. And then that starts to get more and more media coverage. And then people start vandalizing the billboards for real in all these other cities. My staff began calling the Chicago Transit Authority to protest about these offensive ads. Chicago Transit Authority. They put out an announcement that they were banning the ads from the city and they were pulling them off from the buses, which is exactly what we wanted because now this is a news story. The Chicago Tribune actually ran an editorial lauding the CTA's decision to pull the ads. And now it was this sort of full-fledged, massive controversy. In New York City, this group organized a citywide protest slash vandalization of the billboards, and they invited the media along. So got more press there. It became difficult for me to know where the line was. She wants me to sign underwear. What we were doing was generating chatter about the movie. But if you step back and you look at it, it's like you're deceiving more and more people. And then once it started, it couldn't stop. And it just carried on under its own power. There's another version of the fudge factor in which we convince ourselves on all kinds of things that are not perfectly true. For example, the vast majority of people believe that they are better drivers than the average. 
The vast majority of people believe that they have less chance of dying from a heart attack and cancer and all kinds of things. We have these over-optimistic beliefs about ourselves and we convince ourselves that this is actually the truth. Self-deception starts off as we know we are lying to ourselves, or we, we are aware that we are engaging in rationalization, for example. And after a while, we just believe what it is that we're telling ourselves. So that is basically the optimism bias, and we see it in 80% of the population. Self-deception has both positive and negative consequences. I think, on average, the positive must have outweighed the negative for us to evolve, to be able to self-deceive and do it quite a lot. So we have people take this test, and um, some people don't have the answers, and we see how well they do. And these are hard questions, so they don't do very well. Other people, we give them the test, and we give them the answers at the bottom. We say, check them if you want. Up to you. They do terrific on the test. But we give them another test, so we say, here's some new questions, and by the way, there's no answers at the bottom this time. How well do you think you're gonna do? And they don't correct at all. They just think that they're amazing test takers now, and we can even pay them. We can say, look, if you guess how many you're gonna get right, we'll give you a lot of money. No change at all. They just believe, they've deceived themselves into thinking, I'm the greatest trivia <laughs> test taker in the world, and we can't get them to stop doing it. This process of deceiving ourselves is so strong and it happens to us so quickly where we have a twinge of maybe I cheated and then no I didn't I'm a genius and then I'm a genius for the rest of my life. It's so powerful and so strong in us, this impulse. I can tell immediately when someone's not being honest with me. It made me an excellent admissions officer. expelled one person because he had somebody else take all of his SATs for him and it was pretty clear that that was true because he couldn't pass anything what I see happening in the world is that children are more and more being encouraged to be something other than who they truly are you know in the college admissions process is definitely a big offender here so um, when I'd first applied for the job at MIT, I wrote down that I'd gone to this other school where I was actually taking classes instead of my college. I was taking classes at, at RPI in Troy, and I said I'd, I just sort of morphed that into, oh, I went there for undergraduate school. Right. I just sort of morphed it. I felt that at a place like MIT, they wouldn't accept me if I'd come from a you know, Catholic girls' school. I kept getting promoted. And I got a call from someone from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Would I, would I join him in writing a book? Yeah, absolutely. Do you think it is I was on television, I was on the radio, I was in the newspapers, I was a lot of places. I want us to start another revolution tonight because I want us to be able to give our childhood back to our children. Often, you know, you, 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 people, they, they will get a bio and then they'll, or they'll introduce you a certain way. And that, you know, things just, some people think of master's, some people think of PhD, some people this, some people that, and you know, whatever. You know, I thought, I, you know, for me it was just, okay, well, they're doing what they're saying, what they're saying, I don't care, here I am. They frequently called me doctor, because it's just how it was. It seems that, you know, someone had said, oh, she, she was passing herself as a PhD. Well, then things began to unravel pretty hard. Marilee Jones resigned today as Dean of Admissions at MIT after 28 years at that prestigious school. In a statement today, she said, quote, I am deeply sorry for disappointing so many in the MIT community and beyond. I wasn't allowed to see any of my staff members. I was like a persona non grata on campus, and I kept thinking, this is me. I kept saying to people, it's me. It's me. You've known me for years. I'm the same person. And, you know, suddenly I was on the other side of the wall. What just happened to me? Who am I? 
it, it sent me right down, right down deep, where I'd never really been. I think a really important skill is to be good at lying. So, like, if you do it in, like, a really good way, then you don't have to worry about them catching you. So that's why I think it's good to be good at lying. Sometimes you also have to lie in a way because you're making somebody happy. Like, if you're throwing a surprise birthday party, then that means they're obviously trying to help and get ready or do something. And so you're lying to your friend to help them have a good birthday. All creatures, uh, big or small, uh, have deception as part of their armamentary. Oftentimes it's just survival. You know, a plant or a bird might change color and camouflage itself, which is a form of deception. The bigger the brain, the larger the capacity to lie. Chimpanzees, for example, have been known to lie where they may lead their group away from where the food is so that that one particular chimpanzee can come back to the food later on and find that food. It's very common for children, younger children, to, to fib. And for them, it gives them pleasure. It helps them imagine things, and it helps them build their brain and helps them build what is called the theory of mind, a psychological theory by which, as our brains mature, we're able to predict and imagine what the other person's thinking about. And unless children lie and unless children imagine and dream big, they may not have the full capacity to develop a theory of mind. A lie is like a knife. So if you use a knife to stab somebody, it's wrong. If you use a knife to put some butter on your bread, then there's nothing wrong with it. Once I flew from Berlin to, to Milano, we, we got into many kind of like air pockets. I don't know, it was a very, very bad kind of flight. And at some stage, I hear this woman that starts crying and shouting in, in Italian. She was like about, I think, 50 years old. She had a big cross on her neck. And I look back, you know, to the flight attendant because I expect somebody to go to her. And when I look back, I see the the two flat tenants sitting in the back and crying. And this woman keeps shouting in Italian and crying. And I kind of say to myself, you know, ways, something must be done about this woman. And there is an empty seat next to her. And I, uh, so I, I unfasten my seat, but I get next to her, I fasten my seat, but I hold her hand and I said to her, look at me, do I look scared? And she said, no, why, why aren't you scared? And I said, because you know, from, uh, from all the people in this plane, I'm the only one who's an aeronaut, aeronautics engineer. I'm the only one who knows that we are on the safest passenger airplane on Earth, and that it doesn't feel right, but nothing bad is going to happen to us. And she looks at me and it takes time, back, but she stopped kind of crying, and she, and she starts breathing, and you know, and she still holds my hand, and uh, she said, uh, Jesus sent you to me. She said to me, what's the probability that from all the people on Earth, an aeronautic engineer would sit next to me, you know? So, so th this is the kind of lies that I have no moral problem lying about. Because, you know, I think that even if we would have died, you know, I think dying while you're hysterical is less fun than dying while somebody next to you tells you a nice lie. grow up in a social world in which our parents teach us about how to have manners and how to care about other people and how, how not to point at people or not to say all kinds of things. And we learn that a little bit of lying is okay. In an experiment we're conducting right now, we get people to lie and we connect them to a lie detector. And lie detectors basically detect emotional arousal when we feel uncomfortable. And when people cheat for themselves, the lie detector tells us that they're lying. There's no problem detecting it. But sometimes we ask people to cheat for a charity. And then the lie detector is silent. The lie detector doesn't catch anything. Why? Because if we could justify it, we're doing something for a good cause, there's really no arousal. There's no conflict. There's no emotional problem. My name is Kelly. 
Williams Bolar, and I'm from Akron, Ohio. When my oldest daughter was in junior high and my youngest daughter was in second grade, I had concerns with the quality of education. The schools were not at the academic level that they needed to be. My father and I lived in two different school district areas, no more than three miles away from each other. I made a decision, me and my father, that I would enroll my kids in his school district. And as I was filling out the paperwork, I do remember just thinking, what's the possibility that I will get into serious trouble? My daughters loved that school. They taught the children how to be focused academically. They were there for a full year, and then the treasurer of the school called my dad's house, and I answered the phone. He asked me if I was to come there right now, would you be sitting there? Would you be there? And just so happened, you know, I was there. So I was like, yeah, come, you know, if you need to come to see if I'm here, then I'm here. I received a letter from the treasurer and the superintendent. We have clear and convincing evidence that you do not live or reside at 1373 Black Pond, Copley, Ohio, and uh, we have a meeting for you, and we would like for you to come to the meeting. And I remember going to the meeting. I don't know how many men it was, four men, you know, superintendent, treasurer. To solve this problem. And they had attorneys there. I did some things wrong, but I love my kids. And, and I remember just, you know, still trying to say, no, they, they live there, they live there, you know, and, and that became, that became difficult, you know, because it's like you bury yourself more. Deep inside, you know, I was thinking, you know, golly, this is just this, this too much. They were pretty upset. You know, basically, you know, you can take your children and go to another school. I said, okay, that's fine. They don't want them there. I just took the kids out. Roughly two years later, I get an indictment to go to court. The court of common pleas is now in session. They wanted criminal uh, charges. I need to be there for my kids. I need to be a supporter for them. Unfortunately, the means don't justify the end. The verdict was, you know, guilty. All right. My daughters knew. I explained to them what happened because I wanted them to see the effect of lying. You have a small twist in a story, and it be can become, you know, it can become uh, a huge impact in your life. I own a vending machine. I set it up to a price of zero. So what would happen? You would put your money, you would press on the candy you want, you would get the candy and the money. First of all, I put a big sign that says, here's the number to call in case the machine is not working. <laughs> How many people called? Zero, that's right. How many candies did people take? Nobody took more than four. The majority took three or four, like five would be cheating. Three or four is uh, kind, of, kind of okay. I think that what people were basically doing is rationalizing their vending karma. Right, so what people were saying is, I remember some vending machine that took my money before. And that vending machine has to be a close relative of this one. So the other thing that people did was to call their friends. And, and I think you can see the intuition, right? So 
if one of my friends is coming in nougat as well, it's, it's more socially acceptable uh, all of a sudden. In one set of experiments, we got people to work as a team. So imagine you and I are working as a team. And when I cheat, you get some of it. Then when you cheat, I get some of it. What happened now? Cheating goes up. My name is Garrett Bauer, 44 years old, and I used to be a professional stock trader. I love trading. It was more fun than almost anything. Doing a really smart trade was more important to me than even making money. When I first moved to New York, I uh, met my first friend, and his name was Ken. I knew he knew a lawyer. Uh, Matthew Kluger. I worked at a very prestigious firm that represented some of the biggest names in corporate America. I had known Ken Robinson for a couple of years. We talked to each other on the phone. He said, so you're working on these high-profile deals? And I said, yes. He said, so let me get this straight. You kind of get to read tomorrow's paper today. And he said, you know, that information could be valuable to someone. And I said, yeah, but it's very risky. It's highly illegal. Ken said, I have a friend who's a big day trader who could take that information and use it to great advantage, but could probably avoid detection because he does a lot of day trading. We set up a meeting on the street corner and talked for maybe an hour. By just entering into a discussion of the possibility of doing this, I was crossing the line, but it didn't feel like that at that point. Bauer put me at ease that what we were doing, though wrong, was A, common, and B, not really hurting anybody. Insider trading information is passed around. If it's not daily, it's weekly. There are a lot of people out there who are becoming privy to inside information and using it to trade. Everyone's trading on this stuff. There wasn't one person in my office that wasn't. I passed information and the scheme gelled. Matt would call Ken with information somewhat like, we think IBM is buying Sun Microsystems. Then they would tell me how many shares. We'd subtract the tax rate, I'd pay the taxes, and then they would get the cash. I did not expect it to take on a life of its own. And then it took on a life of its own. One night, Ken called me and said his house had been raided. I don't remember everything he said on that call, but I remember thinking that some of what he said was a little suspicious and was wondering, is it possible someone is listening? But I dismissed that as being paranoia. What about the information of the law firm? That's what I worry about. Like, when you did searches or I don't know how you did it. I don't, if they had that, they would have been here already. There's a big difference between what they know is probably a lie and what they think they can prove is a lie. They go to court without phone calls, without a trail, without a, this happened at this time. Right. They, they just don't have any of that. Right. And I was arrested the next morning. I sit up out of bed and I hear someone say, um, Garrett Bauer, where are you? Clearly, I'm thinking it's pretty serious when you have that many FBI agents in your apartment. Federal prosecutors have charged two men with an insider trading scheme that went on for 17 years. Our investigation has documented more than $109 million in illegal trades. Bauer and Kluger pleaded guilty to securities fraud, conspiracy to commit money laundering, and obstructing justice. Are there more men 
overrepresented in the large teachers than women? Yeah, so first of all, this is a great question. So the question is, are there gender differences between cheating in men and women? And there are huge differences, huge differences. And the difference is that only women ask this question. <laughs> but in terms of cheating, there's no difference. Now, <laughs> I was sitting in the lounge, charging my phone, and all of a sudden you hear the announcement, your flight's about to take off. So I run out, and I get to my flight, and I sit in my seat, and I realize as the door is closing, my phone is in the charger in the lounge. I run up to the girls in the front, the stewards of which, you must sit down, miss, we're just taking off, you must. No, you can't. My phone's in the lounge. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, listen, I work with CNN News. Suspects now on I'm on the air tomorrow, and I need to have my phone because everything that I've just worked on is sitting in this phone. So I, guess what? The plane went back, they got my phone. A woman hands me my phone, and everyone in the place looks at me and goes, In one project, Dan and Shahar Yal and I decided to look at what's the influence of others' unethical behavior on our own decisions to cheat. So we designed an experiment with different type of conditions. So imagine the same experiment I described to you before, but with one main difference. We hired an acting student. And 30 seconds into the experiment, he raised his hand. Yeah, I, I got all of them. Can I, what do I do? And they say, I solved everything. What do I do next? I should come up here. I'm dead. Now, this is 30 seconds into the experiment. You are still on question number one. <laughs> there is no question in your mind that that person is cheating. And the experimenter said, you finished everything. You're free to go. There you go. Thanks very and much. And you see that person taking all the amount of money and going home. What would happen to your own morality? Well, lots more people cheat. But there could be two explanations here. One explanation is we just prove to people that in this experiment there's no downside for cheating. The second possibility is that it's not about the fact that they wouldn't catch you, it's about the fact that it's actually socially OK. Thank you for participating. And so we decided to study this by looking at whether the person cheating is somebody like us, or somebody we feel similar to, or somebody who's very different from us. We ran this experiment at Carnegie Mellon. Everybody was a Carnegie Mellon student. The acting student was a Carnegie Mellon student. We dressed the acting student in the University of Pittsburgh switch. Now, what happens if you're a University of Carnegie Mellon student and a Pittsburgh student cheats? <laughs> you still know that you can get away with it. Here's the proof that somebody goes home with all the money. But you don't think that people like you are doing it. And what happens now? Cheating goes down. So it's not about the probability of being caught. It's about the question of what is socially acceptable in our circle. My name is Erica Nelson. I am from Florida. I'm married to my husband, Kenny. And we have a total of six children. Him and I have two children together. He has a really good heart, and we had a really good relationship. But to go from nothing to having six children, you know, it was a lot. <laughs> so he kind of like dove into his work, and we weren't having sex, we weren't, um, we weren't even talking, you know? It was all about like the kids and then his work, and that was really it. And I was just kind of, you know, wiping butts from the moment I got up to the moment I went to bed, and that was kind of my life. Good day, I had a bra on. <laughs> it was my dress up day. I kind of just got lost in that. But I really loved my husband and I wanted to make it work. So I would try to talk to him, and no matter what I say, it doesn't seem to get through to him. Nothing changes. I even went to him crying the last time, and I said, look, I need more than this you know, in my life. And I love you enough to tell you this because I don't want to ruin this. And um, he was like, eh. 
Not that he was indifferent. I just think that he thought, eh, you know, we'll get through it. I didn't take it like that. I took it as a slap in the face. Ashley Madison is a website for married people or people that are in a committed relationship that want to have random sex or hookups or whatever. I think that that's an appeal to Ashley Madison. You know that everybody knows that you're married, you know, so there's not that awkwardness. You check your area, and we live in a small little community, and there's like, you know, hundreds of people on there. And it's, it's easy to kind of mask um, the reality of what you're doing, too, because you're behind a computer screen. I talked to one guy. We had actually a really, we had like a pretty good friendship um, for a few months. And then it got more into like intimate conversations and talks, and then let's meet up. He would take me to fancy restaurants, I would get dressed up. And I'm thinking, wow, this would be awesome. I could have like this whole home life and then I could, you know, and be the good parent, be the good mom. Then I can have this whole other life of jet setting and, you know, wearing bras and dressing up and wearing makeup and doing your hair. Polar opposite of what I had going on at home. And I think that I almost was more attracted to that than anything else. And I would lie and say that I was just gonna go to hang out with my friend or I was gonna go, you know, visit my parents or whatever, you know, to see him. So I think, I think that even when you know it's wrong, the immediate gratification suffocates what you know is right. So I came home one night and I asked my husband, are you going out of town this week at all? And he said, why? So you can talk to him on the phone, why I'm not here? And I just said, how did you find out? And then he kind of walked away, and then I followed him upstairs. I didn't know how long he had known. I didn't know what he knew. So all these questions went in my head. And he said, you left up an email. And he said, you know, I came in the office, and the email was there from the night before. And I read all of them. And I said, look, you know, I was going to get attention or whatever from somebody else. As, as messed up as that is, that's how I am. And and I can't, I don't know how to get over that. So I need like your help or I need somebody's help. I said, but I don't want to mess this up between us. I saw how hurt he was and my husband didn't deserve it. And um, I deleted my account that day. So as I told you, I was, I was badly burned. And when I came back to the hospital, maybe four or five years after I was released, the head of the burn department finds me and he said, Dan, I have a new fantastic treatment for you. Come with me. I go with him and he explains to me that when I shave, I have little black dots on the left side of my face, stubble. The right side of my face is burned. There's no hair, there's no stubble. And he can fix this asymmetry. How? He's going to tattoo the right side of my face <laughs> until it would fit the left side of my face. And he says, go home, shave, come back tomorrow. By noon, you'll be symmetrical. So I drive, I drive home, and I think to myself, what kind of shave should I aim for? <laughs> what would give me the most hours of symmetry? The early morning shave, the afternoon shadow, what's the right, what's the right shave? Anyway, I shave, I get to his office. And I said, you know, I'm not so sure I want this. But I'm not so sure it's for me. And then he looks at me and says, Dan, what's wrong with you? Do you enjoy looking non-symmetrical? <laughs> Do you get some deprived pleasure from looking different? <laughs> anyway, I, I, I left and I went to his deputy and I said, what's going on? Like, where's this guilt trip coming from? He says, well, you know, we've done it on two patients already and we need a third for an academic paper. <laughs> and I'm kind of an ideal client, right? Half the face burned, half not, would come out really good in this paper. Now, here's the thing. It's really easy to think about this physician as being evil. But this guy was an amazing physician. I really loved him. I owe him a lot. But nevertheless, at that moment, he had a conflict of interest. 
On the computer screen, you will see a square. It will be divided into two. There'll be a right half and a left half. We're going to flash some dots in this square just for half a second. Your task, if you were a participant in the experiment, is just to tell me which side of the line has more dots. And it's usually pretty obvious which side. There's like a lot here and not very many here. Now, there's one more thing. We're not going to pay you the same amount for the right and for the left. But regardless of the amount, your task is to basically be as accurate and truthful as possible. Ready? Go. The dot task is a basic experiment in conflicts of interest. Very, very few people start by lying egregiously. But if the dots are kind of similar, just slightly more to the left, they would say right. Almost any moral conflict you can think of as there's a line <laughs> and you have to decide whether you're going to cross it or not. You kind of want to go to the other side and you kind of know what the right side is. Maybe I'll go to the other side sometimes. My name is Tim Dunnegy. I grew up in Havertown, Pennsylvania. My father was a college basketball official, and because of that and because of my love of sports, you know, I followed in his footsteps and pursued a career as an NBA basketball referee. It's about as good a defense as you can get. The NBA is a much different game, if you will, from high school and college. Even though a lot of the rules are written the same, uh, they're not enforced the same. I started the referee, uh, you know, based on the rules and how they're written in the rule book. Tim Donaghy, the rookie official, is calling it very tight here in the early going. A lot of offensive fouls and picks, so they're calling it by the rule book. Unfortunately, I saw some people that were moving up a little bit quicker than me. I learned from the veterans that there's a certain craft and a certain way that you have to do things in order to advance. And, you know, they'll tell you certain players are given the benefit of maybe traveling with the basketball rather than other players. Certain uh, players are getting the benefit of not having that critical foul called on them that would send them to the bench. Rubio gets a look. Good if it goes. Oh, my gosh. That's just a horrible call by Jason Phillips, who did not have the courage to call that against Kobe Bryant. Wow. An awful no call. It's probably about 50-50 when you, when you look at calls that are enforced by the rule book and then calls that are made or not made based on star treatment, pressure from coaches at certain times. What changed those last few minutes for you guys? The guys are the whistles. I've never had conversations with the commissioner about what to call in a game and what not to call in a game, but from the operations department, they clearly dictate uh, through video, through emails, through meetings, what they want called and what they don't want called. And it always seems to revolve around the star players or the big market teams. Kobe Bryant's a star in this league. He puts a lot of people in the stands, he sells a lot of sneakers, and he sells a lot of jerseys. And uh, the fans played an enormous amount of money to sit in those uh, courtside seats, and they want those type of players on the floor. That's who they came to see. Bottom line is it's, it's more of a form of entertainment than an actual athletic competition. I don't think the officials feel that they're not doing something that's not right because in their minds, they're being told what to do from the league office. And if they're going to continue to advance and get those big playoff bonus checks, you're going to do what the league wants. And Reggie Miller, who is a 90% being an NBA referee and being involved in the planning of how the game was going to be called that night, I knew certain teams were going to be at an advantage or a disadvantage. And it was just a, a situation where I crossed a line that I shouldn't have been near. Never forget when the first situation arose, a friend of mine was looking at the lines in the NBA games and he just asked me to help him pick some winners. And I remember I was looking at the master schedule of referees that night and I knew who was refereeing certain games and I, and I picked some games for him and the games did very well and he called me the next day and you know we just had a frank, frank conversation. I knew a, a certain line was way off or I knew a certain referee was uh, you know going to give special treatment to a certain owner, team or individual player so I passed that information along to my buddy and he was kind of shocked that I could predict the outcome of a game. We would discuss 
certain games that we both liked and because of my contract with the NBA, I wasn't allowed to place a bet of any kind. So he would contact the bookies and put everything under his name for both of us. It got to the point where we were gambling probably three or four games a week in the NBA. At, um, as time went on, I, I started to feel guilty about doing it. And, you know, basically I wanted to stop. What I didn't realize is, is my good friend was passing this information along to people that were associated with organized crime. And they were basically betting an enormous amount of money based on the information that I was giving him. They picked me up outside a hotel in Philadelphia and basically took me for a ride in, in the car and made it known that, that they had been getting that information and pictures were going to continue to come and if not, somebody would visit my wife and kids down in Florida. So my quick thoughts were uh, to, to play ball with them a little bit and, and hopefully at the end of this coming season, they would release me from the grips and, and make enough money to where, you know, we could all just wash our hands of this and, and be done with it and never do it again. And I could continue to keep my job and just move in a different direction. What happens is, is the season ends. I'm back home in Sarasota, Florida, getting ready to play golf. And I get a call from a, a friend of mine who tells me that the FBI has been knocking on a lot of people's doors and that uh, the whole scheme was discovered over uh, a Gambino wiretap and that uh, they were asking a lot of questions. Today, former NBA referee Tim Dunahee is expected to plead guilty in federal court in connection with allegations that he bet on games in which he officiated. We kind of anecdotally know that once you lie, you're more likely to lie again. And probably the second lie will be bigger than the first. What we find in the brain is that at the beginning, if you lie a little bit, there's a huge response in regions involved in emotion, such as the amygdala and the insula. The 10th time you lie, even if you lie the same amount, the response is not that high. So while a lying goes up over time, the response in your brain goes dying. We think that the reason that this happens is because of a very basic principle of the brain, which is the brain adapts. For example, if you're listening to music and it's quite low volume and I turn it up like two notches, it will feel like a really big difference, right? But if you're listening to the radio and it's really high volume and then I put it up two notches, you won't even feel it. The brain is coding everything relative to what the baseline is. The same goes with dishonesty. If we're pretty much honest people and we haven't lied and now we're telling a lie, the brain is coding this as a really big difference relative to our baseline. But if we are dishonest and we lie quite a lot, the brain doesn't respond so much. After a while, the negative value of lying, the negative feeling, um, is just not there so much, which kind of makes you just lie more and more and more. My parents, uh, they grew up in the Bronx and they placed a lot of emphasis on getting me and my two brothers around the kitchen table every night for dinner. The role that I grew into was an insane fabulist. I just lied constantly. Oh, I was down at the basketball court and uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar showed up and I smacked his shot away and I said, get that skyhook trash out of my face, Kareem. My family would roll their eyes. Until one night, I talked about how there's a pickup game and we're tied. Next basket's gonna win the game. Someone from my team puts up a shot. I went up to rebound it. The ball bounced off my head arced in the air, swish into the basket, I win the game. And everyone in my family, all at once, they had finally had it. Stop lying to us. That is ridiculous. That did not happen. But here's the thing about it. I, to this day, I can see the texture of the basketball. 
and I can feel myself doing this and the ball going in and the exaltation like lives in me still. In my head I know it's a lie, in my heart I can't let go. We did a study with 12,000 golf players. We said, imagine the ball fell on the rough, not a good place, and you really, really wanted it to be four inches to the left. Would you pick it up and move it four inches? And people said, heaven forbid. You understand the nature of the game, how people feel about it? Nobody would do that. Fine, nobody does that. What about kicking the ball? No problem whatsoever. <laughs> What about hitting it with a club? It's even easier. And you know what's the easiest? If you're not looking. Like, if you look up, and then you kick a little bit. <laughs> but I think you can feel the intuition that if you pick something up and you moved it, the act would feel incredibly deliberate. But if there was some distance, you kicked it, something happened, all of a sudden, this distance would allow people to have a bit more ambiguity in the connection between them and the final act. So imagine this, the same experiment I described earlier. You fill in your sheets, you solve these little problems, you shred the piece of paper and you come to the experiment. Yeah? You tell them how much money you deserve. You tell it in tokens. I solve X problems, I deserve X tokens. So now you pay them in pieces of plastic. They take this piece of plastic, walk 12 feet to the side and change it for dollars. So when somebody looks you in the eyes and they lie, they don't lie for money, they lie for something else, but that thing becomes money very quickly. What happened? In our experiment, people doubled their cheating. There you go. Thank you. This, by the way, is the most troubling result I think we got. Think about it. In a society, we're moving away from money. Credit cards, stock, stock options, derivatives, dealing with people over great distances. Could it be that as these distances in all of their versions are increasing, people find it easier to misbehave and still think of themselves or ourselves as good people? And I think the answer is absolutely, absolutely yes. My name is Walt Pavlo. I grew up in uh, Savannah, Georgia. I was the first one on either side of my family to ever go to college. I worked for MCI very large telecommunications company. I was a bill collector. But they weren't telephone bills you and I open up each month. They were for large companies. While I was managing customers that were paying their bill on time, I was getting a small number of customers that were involved in things like 900 business. Those types of companies aren't exactly good business people. One company owed MCI in excess of like $50 million. And um, I took this to my management and said, well, what, what do I do with this guy? He owes us $50 million. We have to, in accounting terms, do a write-off. Just really tell our shareholders that, you know, that $50 million that we've, we were expecting from this customer, it's not going to come in. And instead, I was told, we're not going to tell anybody about it. We're going to leave it on MCI's accounting records, and we're going to do some, some uh, cooking of the books, if you will, to allow this debt to be put off into the future. So it looks like it's going to be collected at some other time. The ability for me to, to move numbers around was something that I knew that was wrong, but at the same time, it took a lot of pressure off of me. And before I knew it, I had moved around or not told shareholders about probably $100 million worth of debt that wasn't on MCI's books. It really is, is, is that simple. I mean, it's just, a, it's just an accounting entry. It's just a number. I felt a sense that it wasn't going to be very much longer, that there are ways to undo this and you know, turn the clock backwards in, in a few months. And then I realized that it's, this isn't going to happen. <laughs> you know, customers still aren't paying us. The amount of money that I've manipulated is getting larger. I'm working for a company that doesn't care the pressure that they put me under. So I confided in somebody outside of MCI and said, hey, I, you know, I'm looking for some advice. What do I do in this situation? He says, Walt, I, I have an idea. I think that there's a way that we can get some of these customers to pay MCI's debts. That solves your other problem in that you're actually going to see money coming in again. And then third, Walt, 
I think I can make you and I a hell of a lot of money doing this. And I was like, what was number three again? <laughs> I felt a sense of empowerment, you know, really cockiness, you know, if there's money involved, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm doing this, yeah, I, you know, this is the way this is supposed to work. Hi, Walt. Hi. This is pretty cool. Real cool. I can tell you, that feeling didn't last very long. I went down to the Cayman Islands. I went on a private jet, and a guy hands me a lot of money, and I'm like, oh my God, what is this? What have I done? How far have I, have I taken this thing? No more. I don't want to do this anymore. Six months after that, um, I got received a call from uh, my boss. Somebody from accounting has called me and told me something's wrong with one of the accounting entries, and they need an explanation for it. For a split second, for a split second, I said, I can fix this. And then the totality of of what I had done, it, just, it was just coming crashing down. I mean, there's, there was no way that I could fix it. I've been caught. WorldCom said last night that an internal investigation has uncovered massive accounting fraud, almost $4 billion in disguised expenses in what could become one of the biggest accounting scandals in U.S. history. Now, when we run these experiments, we run them either at universities or in bars. We went to a bar in Washington, D.C., where congressional staffers hang out in. And we went to a bar in New York City where bankers hang out in. So who cheats more, the bankers or the politicians? <laughs> who votes for bankers? Who votes for politicians? OK, many more for politicians. The bankers cheated twice as much. You can't be happy with this result. Like, there's no, there's no way that this is a good result. If we took all the elements that we studied and we combined them into one environment, we would get an environment that is very similar to the one that operated in the financial crisis of 2008. Not in generations has Wall Street absorbed the number of body blows it took today. Three of the five biggest investment banks are gone. The country's biggest mortgage lender is gone. We had politicians, bankers, regulators, and even investors, all influenced by many factors. Self-deception, social norms, distance from money, lying for the benefits of others, and of course, conflicts of interest. And this is what I think corruption is all about. It's about that when you get into a system, and something in the system tells you that things are wrong there, all of a sudden you abandon your own moral fiber. And because of that, we really need to figure out what can we do about it? How can we get people to behave better? Because if we don't, we're just going to get more and more disasters like the one we've just experienced. Founder. He was always very keen about character formation uh, for children, more than making them score marks. Because when we sow that seed, when they are very young, when they grow up, it blossoms. <laughs> If anybody wants to purchase any stationery things, the first thing is uh, they'll uh, uh, come and look at the price list and they'll uh, pick up whatever they wish to take and they'll uh, put the rupee inside that bowl and if there'll be no monitoring, they'll get it by themselves. When I was a kid, I was doing a lot of work. 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 
இருக்கும் அப்பப்போ ப்ரே ப்ரேயரில் மேடம் சொல்லுவாங்க அது நமக்கு ஃப்யூச்சரில் நமக்கு ஒரு பெரிய ஒரு லாஸும் ஏற்படுத்தும் திஸ் ஹானஸ்ட் இஸ் ஹேப்பனிங் எவ்ரி வெரி இன் அவர் ஸ்கூல் இந்தியா நின்னும் ஃப்ரம் ஹை கிளாஸ் சில்ட்ரன் த லோவர் சில்ட்ரன் ஆல்சோ கேம் டு நோ வாட் இஸ் மெயின் பை ஹானஸ்டி மேலோட்டமாக பார்க்குறவங்களுக்கு அது ஒரு பொருள் எடுக்கிற ஷாப்பாக தான் தெரியும் ஆனால் அதுக்குள்ளே ஆழமாக போய் பார்த்தா டீச் டீச் த ஆனஸ்டி அண்டு நம்ம எவ்வளோ மேம் நம்ம மேலே எவ்வளோ நம்பிக்கை வச்சுருக்குறாங்க ஸ்டூடெண்ட்ஸ் மேலே எவ்வளோ நம்பிக்கை வச்சுருக்குறாங்க எங் அங்கே பார்க்குறதுக்கு யாருமே இருக்க மாட்டாங்க அதனால் நாங்கள் எது வேணால் எடுத்துக்கலான்னு எங்களை தூண்டும் ஆனால் நாங்கள் அப்படி எடுத்துக்க மாட்டோம் ஏன்னா ஏன்னா பொய் பேசாமல் திருடாமல் ஏமாத்தாமல்லாம் இருந்தால் வாழ்க்கையில் நம்மளால் ஜெயிக்க முடியும்னா Many of the experiments that we have conducted are about trying to find ways to curb this honesty. We went to UCLA and we asked about 500 undergrads to try and recall the 10 commandments. We asked people to write down as many of the 10 commandments as they could remember and then we put them in a situation where they could cheat with the matrix task. How many of them do you think recalled all 10 commandments? 0, that's right. <laughs> By the way, they invented lots of interesting ones. <laughs> What happened after people tried to recall the Ten Commandments, even if they were unsuccessful? Nobody cheated. It wasn't as if the people who remembered more commandments, the people who are presumably more religious, cheated less, and the people who remembered almost none of them cheated more. Nobody cheated. It didn't matter what religion the participants had. You know what the Ten Commandments are about. They are about a moral code they are about proper behavior and just knowing that and being reminded of that decreases dishonesty in fact even when we take self declared atheists and ask them to swear in the bible they stop cheating it is not about heaven and hell and being caught it's about reminding ourselves about our own moral fiber we found this result to be very promising but we wanted to test it in a non religious context so we went to MIT and we did a similar experiment with honor codes so we got students at MIT to sign the honor code i understand that this short study falls under the MIT honor code they did it shredded the piece of paper what happened no cheating whatsoever and no cheating whatsoever despite the fact that MIT doesn't have an honor code <laughs> then we replicated the experiment at princeton princeton has a very strong honor code in fact the freshmen get a whole week of a uh, crash course on morality lectures discussion the a cappella group has a song on the honor code it's an awful song by the way but they they have it so we took the princeton students signing the honor code they're not signing the honor code the mit students signing the honor code they're not was there any difference no When they did not sign the honor code, they both cheated to the same level. When they signed the honor code, none of them cheated. And I think this is kind of a mixture of good news and bad news. The bad news is the crash course on morality, particularly the Princeton version doesn't seem to have any effect 2 weeks down the road. The good news is that even without a crash course, reminding people about their own moral fiber does change how people behave. the fact that we can change you with these tiny tiny interventions is actually at the heart of behavioral economics it's it's this idea that we think that to change people's behavior we need to change a society or change a culture and in fact sometimes little tiny tweaks around the edges can have big impacts on what we do i feel that both in collaborating with organization as well as government we could make a difference as scientists i think we could design intervention that would be helpful in reducing unethical behavior at work as well as in society more broadly. The Behavioral Insights team was set up um, by the British government, by Prime Minister David Cameron in 2010 with the new coalition government. And the idea was to introduce a more realistic model into um how people actually make decisions and um what drives their behavior and if we did that we'd make better policy. And it turns out a lot of both tax and benefits actually rest on honesty. When we add one line into our tax letter saying 
Most people pay their tax on time. But it turns out, not only is it effective, it's also a nicer way of encouraging people to pay their tax than just to threaten them. We increased payment rates from about 30% to about 35%. Now, you could say that's not very much. You know, it's not going from 30% to 100%. Or you could say this is literally just one line of text and suddenly you're talking about hundreds of millions of pounds of revenue brought forward to your tax authority. Once you start turning the needle in lots of different places simultaneously, you start to see that the effects build upon one another and start to add up to something quite profound. Dishonesty is sort of contagious, and we see this in many contexts, both in the real world and in lab experiments. It has an even wider ramification, which is how do you feel about other people around you? In Scandinavian countries, more than 60% of people will generally say most people can be trusted. In other countries, much of Africa and South America, it's often below 10%. It's an enormous advantage to live in a country where there's high social trust. It turns out it boosts economic growth when you build it into an equation. It's more important, for example, than levels of skills in the economy. We've been kind of stumbling in the dark with really naive models of human behavior built into policy. Imagine what we can do if we put even a half-decent model of how people behave into um, what we do and how we design our economies and societies. How many people here grew up in countries outside of the US? Please raise your hands. Keep your hands up outside of the US. OK. And how many of you think that people in your country of origin cheat less than Americans? Less than Americans, keep your hands up. <laughs> Canadian? <laughs> British. British. Yeah, of course. Um, British. Anybody else thought that they cheat less? Tanzania? Are you joking? I think you didn't hear the question. So I grew up in Israel, so the first place I went to test was Israel. I was sure that the Israelis would cheat more. No, they cheat just the same. We tried Turkey, China, Colombia, South Africa, Portugal. We tried Germany. And in all of those countries, we don't find any real difference. Now, how can it be? We've all traveled. We've all been to different places. And we all get the feeling that cheating feels differently in different places. And here's the thing. Our experiments are general and abstract. And because of that, they captured the basic human ability to cheat and feel good about ourselves. And from that perspective, we're not different. We're the same the world over. And for me, this is the big lesson. It's not about being bad. It's about being human. And because of that, it means that we all need to think about how do we protect ourselves against our own bad behavior and the bad behavior of other people. We have much more to learn and a lot to gain from understanding our ethical shortcomings. When it comes to building the physical world, we seem to understand our limitations. We build things like roads and bridges to help us with these things that we can't do perfectly on our own. But when it comes to the mental world, we somehow forget the idea that we're limited, that we're fallible. Science have some starting points to help us think about this. It's not going to be simple, but we all have the capacity to build a better, more ethical, more honest world. It took me a long time to come to grips with the fact that I was going to go to prison. And it wasn't because I didn't know that I was guilty. I mean, I knew that I, for sure that I was. I knew that what I had done is wrong, and I wanted to make it right. But what I couldn't come to face with was the consequences. I had to fall on the uh, sword and let everybody know that I basically screwed up and I made some terrible, terrible choices. It really, I mean, it destroyed my life, to be honest with you. I'm pretty honest now. I'm about like honest Abe. I'm, <laughs> I try to, tell, try to tell the truth about everything. It's not like there was one thing where I said, like, that was so wrong, I'm, I'm never gonna do that ever again, I'm done. It's more like, on everything that I did, there were parts that I didn't like that bothered me, 
and those added up over time. I regret it all. I mean, because I, I would like to be honest with my girls and tell them, you know, that I went the higher route and that I didn't cheat and that, you know, one wrong doesn't make a right and preach all that to them, but I can't. I mean, if my girls ask me about my infidelity, I'm gonna be honest with them because it's who I am and I need to own it. I used to think of the world in terms of good people and bad people, and now I think of the world of as people. <laughs> well, when I do get out of jail, my brother said he will help me, but I just don't know what I'm gonna do at all. Uh, I figured I have a lot of time to think about that. Thank you.